Thank you very much, dear colleague Machelat. Uh, dear representative, general speaking, we don't have so much time. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard about this. We will talk about the fifth IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The official German translation is Zwischenstaatlicher Ausschuss für Klimaänderung, but uh, the media will call it always Weltklimarat. So we talk about the key statements and some remarks from my side. But of course I will talk about the summary of for policymakers and the technical summary and you will see why because the total content of the total report is very comprehensive. So you will always see the key statements. So uh, this is the original of the IPCC report and when I talk about remarks, so these are my own personal remarks. But um, first of all some basic information and most of you will know about this, I don't have to talk about this in detail. IPCC was uh, established by WMO and UNEP and there are three working groups. The first working group is physical science basis, the second impacts and adaptation and vulnerability and the third mitigation. And a uh, comprehensive report so far were in 1990, 1996, 2001 and 2007. And we talk about the last uh, report, the assessment report 5. Uh, the first working group published it in September 2013 and now also working groups 2 and 3 published their reports. And you can use it on the internet, you can look into it on the internet. Uh, it will be also available in a printed version. And now the content. The total content is 2,216 pages plus annex. And the annex uh, take care about uh, the regional uh, aspects and the total content is about the global aspects. And we will talk about the global aspects now and also the next presentation will talk about the global aspects and then later on the presentations will tear off the local aspects. So there were more than 800 uh, authors and more than 1,000 experts. In the working group one they used uh, 9,200 publications and you know that in 2007 IPCC received uh, the Peace Nobel Prize together with the former Vice President of the United States Al Gore. So this was some basic information and now the key statements and you always see this in uh, the image, these are the original key statements and then I give some remarks and you see the pictures and that's why we can go through it very fast. So there are three data sets, uh, the land temperature, the ocean temperature and the anomalies. So this is from the me uh, mean value 1961 to 1960, uh, 90, 96. So you see that the temperature increased and the total increase since 1880 is 0.85 degrees Celsius and this temperature increase accelerated over the past years when you see it, the different time periods and later on when I give my remarks over the last years since 1998 there is not so much increase in temperature but uh, I will also talk about uh, the time series and so we can uh, not only see long-term trends but also fluctuations, uh, annual anomalies so I will talk about this later in detail. Some remarks about this. Uh, 
in the past of the climatic research of the University of Norwich in uh, England. There is the uh, third version of the CRU, the data set. Uh, data set three, you can see it here. In 1998, there was the highest temperature and then it went down again. So this group made a change to the data set and when you compare it, when you compare the two data sets, so that you can see the time series. So the red one is of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in the United States. And you can see it from the different data sets. So in 2010, it was the, the warmest. So you see the increase, but you see also that there was a phase of cooling down and then an increase. So I talk about the observed data and later on I will talk about uh, the model projections. So after the publication of the IPCC uh, report, uh, there were some new models. So when we talk about the data set from Dorwich, it doesn't start in 1880 but we compare it with two other data sets, one you've seen already, and there is another one from Noah. When we look at them together and we calculate the correlations, there's almost no difference, and that's what the IPCC report states. At the bottom, you see the explanation of the uh, abbreviations and you see how many stations were used for this data set. So it's 5,000 to 7,000 stations depending on the institution that made it. So this correlation analysis uh, you don't find in the report but you only have the statement that the data sets are similar. So the English data set already started in 1850 So we never had only this long-term tendency, but you always had fluctuations. I used the filter technique, 20-year uh, smoothing, and you see that sometimes there was a bigger increase, then it goes down again, then a bigger increase again, and, and the fluctuations. So we want to understand this, and luckily, when we see the global temperature, we can uh, understand this very easily, but when we look on a regional level, that's a little bit more complicated. So we continue with the key statements, the temperature trends, the long-term trends, they are not the same all over the world. We don't abo talk about the temperature now, and also when we talk about the precipitation, it's just some very rough uh, data. So this is a very general uh, statement. Uh, in temperature and also in precipitation, there are differences in the different uh, regions, in the different seasons. And when we look at this on an annual level in uh, the central latitudes, there is an increase. But when we look at Saxony as in, in specialty, uh, there are differences in the different seasons. And extreme events increased. So these analyses of precipitation and the extreme events, that's uh, the topic for a total conference. So this is our very general statements. And later on, I will talk about the temperature fluctuations. So that's just a hint, but uh, we would need a whole conference on this. 
in the IPC report you can find something, but not all of this, especially on a regional level. So we continue with the key statements. You can look at different processes uh, that are uh, an effect of the climate change. For example, the regression of uh, mountain glaciers or the regression of the Arctic summer sea ice extent. Since 1950, the ice extent uh, was reduced by 3.5% related to the summer minimum. So the September was used for this. So it's about 10%, 9 to 14% per decade. And you can look at this as a time series. So you can see the source at the bottom, the National Snow and Ice Data Center of the United States. And always when you have time series, there is not only a certain trend, but you also have the fluctuations. But regarding September since 1979 to 2013, in 2013 there was a little bit more, in 2012 there was the minimum so far, and when you look at the blue line, that is the, the trend, uh, it's a decrease of 40%. So, of course, this process will continue, and so in the middle of our century, it might be that this summer, Arctic ice could be uh, gone away. But not only the Arctic ice, but also the glaciers uh, have an influence on the uh, rise of the sea level. So, the sea level, the time series, it's smooth, the ocean reacts uh, very slowly, not only the ocean temperature, but also the uh, sea level uh, reacts slowly. So you see the trend here, so this comes from the ocean, uh, when the temperature increases, it extends, and so also the ocean extends. So about 40% of this increase is because of the thermal expansion of the ocean. So there is, because of the mountain glaciers, uh, because of the Greenland ice cap. Now we get back to the temperature. So. I didn't want to show it to you right now. So we can already start to talk about the courses. So on the left hand side, you see the, the land temperature. There are four data sets. There is another group of Berkeley from the United States. And at the bottom, you see the sea surface temperature. And you see a difference there the land temperature increased much more than the sea temperature. And when you look at the right-hand side, the tropospheric temperature up to 11 kilometers height. But this uh, depends on the uh, geographic latitude. So this curve shows you that the tropospheric temperature also increased. And what is very interesting, it's the ocean heat content. So the heat content increased in the ocean. And this is also one item that is interesting when we talk about the courses. So we can talk, we already talked about this, so we can continue. And now we start the, the discussion about the courses. So we look at the time series over a longer time period. So this is since 850, I think so. So we look at the lower curve first. You see the reconstructed uh, temperature fluctuation, but only for the northern hemisphere. So the long over the long time periods, we have most of the information from the northern hemisphere. 
and I think I put it on the side. So the grave graphs that you can see here in the report before the last one, there were 11 alternatives, different reconstructions with differences, but it's less now, but it's still 10. So the red graphs, these are model simulations. So depending on the reconstruction, you would have to talk about more details. So there is a quantitative insecurity. When we talk about this, we talk about radiative uh, forcing. And in the upper picture, you see something about the radiative forcing. The lower graph, that's uh, the human race, and you see over a long period nothing happens, and then there is the increase. On top there is the solar irradiation, irradiance, and when you look at the model calculations and the analysis, it doesn't play a big role. And then you see at the very top, uh, this is the vol volcanic uh, forces, so always when there is a volcanic eruption, an explosive volcanic uh, eruption, uh, where gases and particles go into the stratosphere. These are uh, sulfur particles, sulfur gases, and they stray the solar irradiance and there is a cooling, but at the same time there's an absorption of the radiation and there is a heating. So this is a nice indicator to identify uh, the volcano impact. So what you can see here, when you look at the volcanic eruptions, there is no systematic trend, and also in solar radiation there is no uh, trend, only uh, with the human impact, and this is because of the greenhouse gases, the uh, carbon dioxide, dioxide. So this is from the IPCC report, the global carbon dioxide emission because of fossil uh, fuels, uh, because of cement production. So it's about 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide and the atmospheric concentration. So of course there was a deadline for the IPCC report, so in 2011 it was 391 parts per million. So this is the time series of Mauna Loa on Hawaii, so that's the longest time series, but there are also indirect reconstructions that go back a longer time, but in the year 2013 there was a value of 396 ppm, and you see uh, that it uh, increases further, also the emissions, there is not only the problem in Germany, that uh, we go back to coal and there will be more carbon dioxide, but uh, in the global range it's the same. When we look in China, uh, to on China, uh, there is a big increase in carbon dioxide emissions and the red uh, graph at the bottom, that's the increase from year to year and so we still have increases. So, jetzt aber habe ich schon einige 
And now I talked about some processes already that are the causes. And you can see that it's not only because of the human impact, it's not only anthro anthropogene uh, reasons, but uh, there's a total complex of reasons. But of course, there's a certain uh, sequence regarding the amount. So this is again the radiative forcing. So uh, this is a primary thinking without uh, feedback in order to simulate all this, uh, we need the climate model uh, calculation. So the radial forcing, that's just the first step. And I won't talk about the details here. You see the different colors here. That's because of the different gases. So there are transformation processes and they uh, influence the climate in different areas. So you see that carbon dioxide plays uh, the biggest role and at the bottom, this is the solar radiation, solar irradiance. Uh, it almost plays any role at all. So this is an overview of the radiative forcing. So there are many different processes, but the uh, human race uh, dominates it. And the total anthropogenic uh, radiative forces is positive. And in this te text you see the numbers. So the total radiative forces is uh, more than 3 watt per square meter. But we have uh, particles from the sulfur. So everything together because of indirect uh, effects that play a big role. It's minus one watt per square meter, so the total is 2.3 watt per square meter. So these are uh, trend radiative forcing. So you should differentiate between long term radiative forces and uh, fluctuative uh, radiative forces. So the experts uh, talked about this, but the authors didn't pay attention to this. And the episodic uh, radiative forcing, uh, this is, for example, volcano eruptions. Uh, for example, the eruption of the Pinotubo in 1991. And it takes a while until the particles formed from the gases. So this was a uh, three watt per, per square meter. So that's something. So there are some effects on the contrary to the previous uh, report. Uh, I only read the summary so far. I haven't read uh, the whole number of 2,216 pages yet. But in the summary, SPM summary uh, for policymakers and TS is the technical summary. Something is missing. For example, the ozone effects and the water vapor in the stratosphere and also the air traffic uh, doesn't play such a big role. So we continue with the key statements. And now I talk about uh, the climate model calculations. So there are comparison models. So there are five. In, in 2007, there were three models. Now it's five. 
So CMIP3, these were 24 uh, calculations, and with the new one there are 39. And what is interesting, and now I talk about uh, the courses, but I have to hurry up a little bit. So when you look at this, I marked this. Wait a second. So I marked this up there. So the black one are the observations and the other ones are the model versions. So the model versions uh, thought that there would be more temperature increase than was actually observed. So, some key statements, the human influence uh, with a very high probability, 95%, uh, is uh, the most, plays the most important role since the middle of the 20th century. So, what does the IPCC report uh, do with these problems? So they tell us that the models are better when they use a longer time period. So the red one is the observation and the black one is the frequency distribution in statistics. So in the middle you see the time period 1984 to 1998. You see that the model is underestimated the real increase in temperature. And in the newer models, the model is overestimated uh, the temperature increase. So I already told you what is written there at the bottom. So over the last years, it was an overestimation, and that's why the skeptics. Uh, think that um, it's so. How can we now cope with that? My working group made statistical analyses by means of neuronal networks, grids. You see the English data set, the black, that's the observation. The red is the simulation, red curve is simulation with neuronal grid. And the arrow pointing downwards, this is, these are the times of volcanic eruptions. And we have the Nino years also. This is the tropical eastern Pacific has a cycle of heating up, which is a large scale effect actually have an impact on the global average or temperature. And it means, and uh, they actually wrote to me on behalf of the IPCC after that analysis, they actually told me, forget about statistics, I should not use them, but I must tell you that there are statistic analyses and Mr. Walter, a colleague of mine, was in Canada last year and actually set up new methods. Continue this has not been published yet, that's why I cannot present this here. But there you have more recent results. Explanations of temperature variations can actually be explained by statistic means if you actually use greenhouse gases and particles, one for uh, heating up, the other for heating down, plus uh, volcanism, sun radi irradiance, and the El Nino events should also be considered as a mix of causes. From model calculations, it's a bit tricky because the external forcings actually have certain impacts, and these are internal. Pardon. And so we can see the frequencies, whether it's more or less frequent. Statistically, it's no problem to describe this and use all these impacts as part causes. In the end, there was a publication 
by Kozaka and Xi in Nature 2013. It was published, which showed or indicated that if you see the former model calculations, black is observation, that you have the old uh, model calculation, and by inclusion, after inclusion of El Nino phases, that means cold, cold water events in the water, then you can actually uh, follow very well this trend. Brief summary, uh, looking forward into the future, and of course with increasing degree of uncertainty with regard to the past, as is normal. However, even for the past, it's tricky to explain everything. Yeah, we have the representative concentration pathways. That means in the future we will reach a certain forcing value against the background of various scenarios. You see the figures on the right hand side. The numbers indicated there, 2, 6, and so on, until 8, 5. This is the radiative forcing by 2100. And the higher the number is, the higher is the anticipated impact, and the higher will be the temperature increase. I added this in the under the table. On the right hand side, we have the probability region, the probable region. And we must add to the scenario to a 6. The representative concentration pathway of 2.6 is not very realistic, it's very unrealistic. Equivalent carbon dioxide concentrations, not only carbon dioxide, but also the other greenhouse gases are included. All these assumptions are included. And we think this is not a final point now. It's one scenario. It can be redefined, or there are certain definitions with ups and downs. But I will not enter into detail, just to tell you that we should drop that for realistic reasons. By 2100, when looking at the upper range scenarios, we see an increase in between 1 and 5 so degrees in the future by 2100 for the sea level, the mean, average mean sea level rounding off a bit. Let's forget about the lowermost scenario. So 30 to 80 centimeters increase in mean sea level is expected, but there are certain events which have not yet been included into our models, also partly because we do not actually know how fast these other events are, for example, the melting of the uh, ice, of the Greenland ice, maybe within two or three hundred years it will have been melt molten off entirely, but there's of course a lot of uncertainty. It may be much, much longer. That means more and more of the Greenland ice sheet are threaded by melting, or have actually melted in the past. 1992, it's rose color, red in 2005, and 2012, almost entirely, almost all ice actually melted, but with a uh, growth, of course, during winter time. But we have certain tipping points uh, which we consider. That means if we actually reach the tipping point, then there will be kind of switch will be actuated and there will be a fast process which is irreversible. That means a finalized melting of the Iceland, of the Greenland ice sheet. Pardon. And then can even seven meter increase be reached in terms of uh, sea levels. But we do not know what the velocity of this event is. I already spoke about that. These are the model projections of the Arctic ice stretches. There are a lot of uh, model calculations and scenarios in red. You see a preferred mix of model calculations and the color of the curve shows uh, whether it's a high range scenario or the worst case scenario. 
Then we see that there is a steep uh, flattening. That means all ice will melt. Several additional remarks. We have the climate sensitivity. This is the response of the global air temperature with regard to a doubling of the CO2 emission as compared to the pre-industrialized level. And we think, and then we uh, try to find the balance state. 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius is the estimated value against 2.0 to 4.5, which was in the report number four. But I think this uh, deviation is not so critical. It's almost the same as to the Arctic sea ice uh, extension. We, uh, we, we have certain scenarios. Either it's already molten off by 2050, but there are also other scenarios farther in the future. And then another mention, collapse of the Atlantic circulation. It's about the Gulf Stream, the tipping point of the Gulf Stream. So if the Gulf Stream actually ceases to flow, then the temperatures will fall for us in the European area. But for our century, it is not very probable. Nevertheless, we do not understand everything until the end, so that means in the longer run, even such a drastic event cannot be excluded entirely. That's the end of my presentation. I'd like to sh uh, mention the IPCC website. I can tell you there is a coordination point, a coordination body in German language, which you can access in, uh, at in the internet. Then. Uh, a book is being printed and will be, pub will be published before short at Cambridge University Press and my own website. Many thanks for your attention. Mr. Schönwiese, many thanks to you. I'd like to be a bit nasty, so to say. In September, I think, in Berlin, I was invited by the German coordination body of the IPCC in order to discuss the first contents or to present the results. There was this was the most clear. <laughs> what, what you actually told us was the clearest and best structured presentation. You have what, what we we have seen a, such a lot of content, which was is more than uh, we, we saw last time in the internal body. So I was very frustrated in order not to have got so much information today. It was much more. So if there are any questions, but I, I'll be here also for the final discussion. Ah, but there is a question. Temperature curve between 1940 and 1980. How do you make the analysis? How do you explain the difference? Yes, thank you for the question. Between 1945 and 1975, 1980, we had a slight decrease in the global temperature. That's because of the post-Second War uh, increase in sulfate particles which concentrate accumulated in the lower spheres of the atmosphere. But the first air purity, air con pollution control measures in Europe and also USA, not so in uh, Asia, then uh, the greenhouses um, were stronger. Yes, this can be actually seen and explained the sulfate particles had a strong impact on the trend. Many thanks also for this very good uh, question. On page 43 in the abstract booklet, you will find the CO2 curve, which is a mix of various data sets. In March 2014, we had 499.95 ppm in May. Meanwhile, we, we reached the 401, so 409 it was, and 401. So that means we are a bit in advance against last year, and that actually um, supports the